Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of Closers. I am uh, your resident closer, David Ardsma, uh, the DA, and uh, with me, as always, my man, James Kudianos. James, what are you? What's up, everybody? Are you the loser? You're the loser. Always. Got to say it. Is your idea, so I kind of have to say this. Yeah, you know, we have the closer and then take away the C and you have the loser, which is me. And if you saw the way I played golf today, you would know for sure that I was a loser. Well, the problem is, and so I, I've noticed this. So my son, DZ, again, as you know, this made the made a high school golf team. And I, again, he's a great golfer. Um, he's a lot better ball striker than I am on consistency. I tend to, he beats me, but I think a lot of that has to do with like the old man rule where he just hits it enough. Uh, he doesn't have the power to hit it out of bounds most of the time. And I, when I'm going for it, I'm, I have bounds. And so I'm always taking those strokes, but he's also better. Go- he will be a much better golfer than me. But I always notice, and I notice this by myself, when I play with better golfers, I am such a better golfer. When I, My best round of my life, when I shot a 79, that was with uh, two other guys that were great golfers. So I'm just hitting it with them. Just watching good, I become good. Watching bad, I become really bad. And when you're when you're out there with uh, two kids and they're putting, probably spraying the ball everywhere, including behind you, um, you end up uh, just playing bad too, don't you? I'm just at the point where I'm so desperate to get decent enough where I can beg a friend of mine who is a member of Michael Jordan's country club to bring me along. Yes. And if he does, I will be showing up and I will have a giant smile on my face and said, Junior, hi, I'm here. Let's do this. <laughs> that would be nice. That'd be very nice. Now, my question is, what do you think Ken Griffey Jr. Jr., who we're talking about here, would do against Paul Skeens? At his peak? At his peak. At, at their peak and Paul Skeens right now. Well, I don't think Paul Skeens is at his peak right now. I think he's just getting going. What I like about Paul Skeens is he's not just a thrower. He's pitching, and we'll talk about that a little more in a second. But I think Junior, who is one of the greatest players of all time, would have success against him like he had against everybody else. He would do his typical, you know, he'll hit 285 against him. He'll take him deep a few times, and he'll have his strikeouts against him. I don't think he's going to go 0 for 20. I don't think so either. I think I think Ken would do pretty good. Ken, I've never called him Ken. It's yeah, weird. it's weird calling him Ken. Kenneth? You call him Con- Kenneth? I don't junior? think I've called him anything other than Junior in years. The kid. I always feel it's weird to the kid. Like, the kid feels like something somebody else called him. And I feel like Junior was like, that's how I know him. But Junior. But I think he would do well. I think he, I think Paul Skeens, uh, I, I think it would take Junior just a little bit to adjust. But I think he would do just fine. Yeah. But speaking of Paul Skeens, we got, we're going to hit that really quick. But first... Pay attention, listen, watch till the end of the episode, and James will tell you about a little special thing we might be giving away to our listeners, our watchers, whatever you guys want to call us, our fans. So make sure you pay attention to the end of the episode. Don't just skip forward. Don't just fast forward right now. (laughs) Listen and watch the rest of the episode. But speaking of uh, Paul Skeen, some more, because we have to talk about him. How's Livy Dunn doing? (laughs) I think Libby Dunn is doing really well. That's fine. I saw she dressed up like uh, like Paul. I thought that was pretty funny. And she did a little like head handstand. I don't know what she did, but she did something and threw a ball. But it was pretty impressive. I I think that's the best Paul Skeen's ever looked in a uniform. Uh, personally, I don't know about you. I got so many things to say, but I want to keep this somewhat PG. I don't want to go rated R all the way, but I do have ideas every time I think about Libby Dunn and Paul Skeen's. I'll leave it at that. Yes, uh, let me done. So, one thing I want to talk about though with Paul Skeens, his warm up. This has gotten a lot of videos. A lot of people have been talking about this. Is something I saw actually in the off season. I've seen it now in season. I've seen him do it. Yeah, right in, in the off season. I saw him doing a training. I saw him doing his preparation stuff, like his, his development side. And I see it now in the big leagues. It's an interesting, uh, different warm up than most pitchers. It's definitely different. James, I know you saw it, and I know you wanted to talk about it. You want to get some of my reaction to it. You wanted to ask me the question. Uh, so I've had some time to think about it, so go for it. Well, I mean, he's got this thing that he's putting up around his shoulders that looks like a yoga mat. I don't know what the hell that is. And he's, you know, he's rotating. And I obviously I know why he's doing that. He's trying to rotate. But have you ever seen that? Have you ever done that? You know, what does that do for you as a pitcher? I mean, this is where, you know, my expertise goes way gone. And it's time to talk to the man who actually played professional baseball. So a yoga mat's a great way to think about it. If you haven't seen this yet, Think about a big yoga mat, a really big yoga mat, but it's not a yoga mat. It's actually an air tube filled with water, 
Okay, it's not the size of a big yoga mat. Air tube filled with water now. It's not filled the whole way. It's filled like halfway or, or, or depending how you want. You fill it a quarter, three quarters or half. I have one here I use for some of my training, my guys. It's about a third, if, if not halfway full. Um, you can make them, you can get them really big, small. Sometimes they can be really heavy. What he does, and, okay, we explain this too. So think about like a little kid uh, transporter, like a backpack, right? Where you've got the kid on your back. He's got like one of those, but it's holding the bag and it's made for the bag and you see him going down the, the mound going down the rubber and then counter rotating with his shoulders and then rotating really hard with the shoulders and so what this is working on and ideally it's working on one balance because the water's moving everywhere it's working on him moving down the mound and getting in a good flow with it with that weight on his shoulders it's working that counter balance so you as you move the water and, and counter your 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 shoulders the water shifts Right, so it, it pushes it a little bit further than you normally would, and then it, and then as you move and you, and you rotate down the mound, it shifts against it too, and it makes it a little hard to do it. It makes it makes you feel more more rotation. I actually use it with with some of my pitchers, guys that have problems like getting that shoulders or their trunk to really open up, their backs a little tight and stuff. So it's really good to open your back up for counter rotation. I, I will say this: I don't like the other side of it, the the front rotation part of it. Mm-hmm. I think it. it focuses too much on rotating your shoulders, which um, I believe, and, and some studies believe, and definitely top velocity side, we believe it puts a lot too much stress on your shoulders, too much stress on your elbow. If you're not, if you're not throwing correctly, if you don't have really strong arms, really strong tendons and ligaments in those, in those pieces. But for Paul Skeens, without a doubt, it works. And it's really interesting that he's done it and brought it to a forefront. This is something that's kind of been behind the scenes for a while for a long time and i kind of experienced this too with when i with the with the braves i was doing some of my top velocity stuff and they actually came out and filmed it once they saw me doing it and they filmed it without me necessarily knowing it and they played that during the game and it was kind of cool that that kind of brought some prominence on another side of training that that people don't normally see so is it sort of like a swing trainer in golf where it's controlling your tempo? Is that what it is? Is it trying to, you know, because you said the, the water is basically moving, shifting from side to side. Is that so that when it gets to the other side, you, you need to stop harder? What, what, you know, what is it doing for you? Think about from a golf standpoint, if you had to, if you were having trouble actually getting higher in the backswing, mm-hmm. okay? Okay. Or, or um, not backswing, but your front, right? Right. So as you're pulling, yeah, backswing. As you're pulling it back, you're having a hard time really opening up your back. This would help you open it up. It, it will tougher to begin with, but once you shift and once you get that weight going and you and the water shifts, it pulls you into a higher position. Okay. So as you're moving down the mound, I'm trying to do this as I'm talking. As you're moving down the mound and you, and you start shifting those shoulders, all that water weight shifts and it actually kind of throws that shoulder further back. So as long as you're moving your hips forward and you still and you drive off that hip, if that you want to, it's called hip to shoulder separation. So you want that shoulder to open up. And so for him, it's a great probably warm up piece, really warms up his hips, warms up his lower back and gets his shoulders warmed up in that rotation. But then once you fire your shoulders and you start rotating, it's going to make that rotation almost faster and more complete and so so it's almost like as if if you're having trouble to following through it'd be a bigger follow-through now it's hard to control very hard to control but if you can it's good and again i i don't like the idea of like rotating faster with your shoulders it can create velocity but it also creates arm injuries so one thing that when i saw it i immediately thought of we've had over the last few years problems with players and their obliques so when you're rotating that fast is that going to be a problem for his obliques it could be but not as not if you're strong enough not if you're mo- mobile enough with them and and if you're rotating more with the shoulders and not pull. a lot of times when guys have oblique issues it's when they pull with their mm-hmm. front side hard and so if you're if you're not doing that separate movement it shouldn't be a big issue and, and again there's some mo- some movements and some deliveries that are prone to being healthy with that movement and sometimes when you start trying harder they tend to hurt you know they tend to pull in areas like for me i would definitely hurt some things if i was doing that on the secondary rotation side but i love the start of it and i have a lot of my guys do it that have trouble opening their shoulders up and just opening up in general it's a great tool to open up and it's incredible again for 
for movement, for balance. And there's so many drills you can do with those things. It's a big bag of water. Try moving around and just moving and, and controlling your body is, is very difficult. You mentioned Top Velocity a couple times later on in the show. We'll tell everybody how they can get in touch with Top Velocity. Yes. Yes. Reach out to me and uh, maybe get some training or, or talk out. We do online training. We do training, um, distance training. I, I do it over the phone, do it over video. Guys come here all the time. I actually had a guy here last week come out and from Oklahoma, University of Kansas kid, come out to train with me. I had a, I had a kid the week before come out from a California university and train with me. And uh, it's been getting fun, James. It's fun yeah. when guys come out and you, you train them and then you, uh, the hard part is you send them on their way and they got to continue with the training. Yeah, you send them on their way and they walk the ballpark like their teacher did. <laughs> walk the ballpark, James. That hurts. Right. That hurts. Hey, leave me alone. You call me a loser at the beginning of every show. I got to have a little fun with you. I'm supposed to because that's the whole idea. You're a loser. I'm the closer. Um, and speaking of a new, I, I think about this as the new loser rule. I hate this rule. Major League Baseball. It's not official. It's an idea getting thrown around. So let's not jump off a bridge yet. But Major League Baseball is throwing out an idea here, James, where you have six inning minimums for starting pitchers and it's going to become a mandatory minimum uh there will be rules uh, against it in case you have to pull them out right there's going to be some rules if you give up a certain amount of runs or have a certain amount of pitches or some other things and none of this is, has gotten ironed out or anything but they're just throwing out some ideas here and I, I and i'm never against throwing ideas against the wall and seeing what sticks I am against making it public, <laughs> and this should never have been public. This is the dumbest idea in the world. The idea, though, is to make starting pitching glamorous again, make make starting pitching great again, and at the same time, value that. And let's be honest, it's about hitting. To me, it's just, it's real dumb. I, you're going to force someone to stay in if, they, if they're at a certain amount of pitches. So what if the matchup dictates that you shouldn't? keep the guy in you're gonna all of a sudden you're gonna tell the guy well guess what you're screwed but let's screw you over a little more doesn't make any sense to me and guess what starting pitching is glamorous when the starting pitching is good paul Skeens is getting all the glamour in the world clayton kershaw has been glamorous for years so you just have to teach the guys how to pitch deeper into ball games maybe if they didn't throw max velo at all times they'd be able to go a little deeper into the ball games well, that's a problem. That's what, that's what we're training these guys. We're starting this in, in high school, college, minor leagues, big leagues. And, and they said something like, oh, like this will force guys to train different. No, it won't because it's not the guys that want to train like this. It's Major League Baseball. So Major League Baseball has basically told us um, that you throw the hardest, you, harder you throw, the more spin you throw, the more off-speed pitches you throw, the more strikeouts you get, the better you're going to be and the more money you're going to make. And then they're going to tell us, oh, but you can't do that. You have to pitch six innings. So they're the ones that set the rule or set the standard and now are going to change the rule. They, they have velocity and spin rates in every single stadium now. And you're telling me like that's that's our fault because we got good at it? How about this? Let's just start here. I have a crazy idea, James. Why don't we learn to hit better? Why don't we teach hitters how to hit instead of trying to teach them how to launch angle exit velocity on every single pitch? What's, what's pretty amazing is some of the best hitters in the league have some of the lowest exit velocities or, or, or slower swings. They're not worried about that stuff. They, they get their hits. Arise, Kwan. You, now you're looking at a guy like Bobby Wood Jr. You're looking at a guy like Aaron Judge. You're looking at across Ozuna. Like, obviously, Shohei, who you, 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 you love all the time. Like, we have these hitters that know how to hit now and are not un, unafraid to do it. And, and you know, let's, let's promote that. Let's promote a new age of hitting because that's all this rule is. It's not a put the, put the pitching on a new pedestal and glamorous, make it glamorous again. They don't give a crap. They want more runs, and the problem is the pitchers are too good. But the hitters need to be better. Well, why don't we just, you know, change the height and the distance of the mound then? They've done it before. Right. Well, that's the thing is like we keep making all these rules. Every single rule that we have made over the last however many years has been against the pitcher. Yeah. There's only one. There's There's been only one rule that is pro pitcher. And that was having the, the mics or whatever the um, uh, pitch comp. Pitch comp. 
Yeah, PitchCom is the only rule that is pro pitcher uh, because of the stealing signs and the reason they change it because you know they're stealing signs and we're having hitting guys and guys basically you know the Red Sox were stealing every single sign and the Astros were stealing every single sign and it was putting such a black eye on baseball they had to do something that's the problem they had, they had to go to such an extreme that teams were cheating in the World Series Astros you were cheating uh, Red Sox you were cheating and many other teams were cheating. That's how they had to change it. That was the only reason they changed it. And so that's the only advantage they've given pitchers is that we don't have to sit there and look at 15 signs before calling a pitch. Other than that, every rule, the shift, the the bigger bases, the um, the pickoff times, you have to face two, that went minimum of three batters. All of these things, the, 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 rule, the timing rule, all of these rules are, are anti-pitcher. And now you're going to try to make another one anti-pitcher. How about this? Teach them how to hit. Teach them how to hit. Teach them how to hit. Promote Quan. Prom- promote a rise. And stop promoting guys that hit, uh, you know, forty home runs and struck out two hundred times. So promoting guys that actually play the game right. You know what they need? They need to send everybody the Fred McGriff, Tom Amansky <laughs> teaching uh, videos. Yes, I, I guarantee. I, I killed it. Oh, the back to back to back AEU uh, national champions. That's actually my fantasy baseball team name. Back to, really? back to back AAU national champions. It's the, yes, they need to learn how to basic baseball. Baseball is a game of ebbs and flows, and so right now the pitcher is at an advantage. But we're I don't think the pitcher advantage is as big as people think it is. I think it's starting to curve down, and the pitcher the hitters are starting to figure it out because of these guys. And I love it. I, I guarantee in five more years we're going to have another ten guys. They're going to be in this boat of hitting 300 again and, and getting on base and, and wreaking havoc because we're, we're starting to push the player that actually does that stuff. I agree. Oh, man. I, I, I love it. I, I, I want to. Bobby Wood Jr. is so exciting. Those guys are so exciting. But some of the other guys that are exciting, the Baltimore Orioles. Yes. The Baltimore Orioles. These kids are amazing. And they have such a good young core. You look all around. You, you've got Gunner. You've got Adley Rushman. You've got Jackson Holiday, who is the not hasn't been great this year, but you know he's the number one prospect in baseball for a reason. He'll turn it around, hopefully. Uh, I highly doubt he's going to be Todd Van Poppel. But I was thinking, with that young core, what do they need to be a perennial World Series contender? And I've come up with the answer, actually, and I don't think anybody really has thought about it or mentioned it. What about the Orioles, who have a brand new owner, who is a billionaire, yes. takes Juan Soto away from the Yankees? Ooh. So I, I love it. And here's the thing. They have the money. The next year, I think they only have, I'm going to throw this out there. I might be totally wrong. I don't think I'm that crazy. I think they only have $35 million or something on the books next year. It, it's something absolutely ridiculous. Obviously, you got some guys you're going to have to pay and, and uh, Kowser, Rud- Rushman, Henderson, you know, um, they got to figure out what they're going to do with Santander, Holiday, you know, all these other prospects and stuff, all the pitching prospects. Where are you going to put them? It doesn't matter. Right, Bill? I mean, yeah, put them in right there. Santander right now, let's, let's think about this. Santander is out there. He, had th- he has 38 home runs. Yeah. He was batting 236, 38 home runs, 522 slugging. He was, he was doing an incredible job. Soto's an upgrade. And Soto's young. He's going to be right there at the same age as these guys, which is still crazy. But I, I, I like it. I love it. Do you really think they would do it? I don't know if Soto would be willing to do it, but, you know, money talks. If they're going to offer him, you know, the biggest deal, and granted, in order to do that, they're going to have to do better than the Yankees. They're going to have to do better than the Mets. But if they really, if that ownership group really wants to put a stamp on, hey, this is my team now, and we're going to be great for the next decade, it's very easy to do when you have that much young talent that's all under contract. You make the big purchase. I think it can happen. I think it can, too. And that's the thing about it is, I mean, don't get me wrong. Here's here's a couple issues. You got Curse that too. You got Mayo. You obviously, Jackson. You got a lot of these kids. You're gonna figure some stuff out. I think Curse that is a, I believe he is a right fielder. So you got to kind of figure that stuff out. But again, if I can get 
<laughs> if I can get Soto, I'm going to get him right now from a left field standpoint. I'm trying to look at this. They don't even have a left fielder standpoint. Well, that's interesting. Well, think about this, though. Even if they have to move Santander or they have to move Kerstad, you're going to get a good amount for that guy because they're still young and they're under control. And what are you going to need then? You're going to need pitching. Now, we don't know if they're going to be able to keep Burns. So you have to bring in a pitcher. And I have an answer for that, too, by the way. Yes, because Burns will be a free agent as well. But you're going to have Radish, Eflin. You're going to have a Grayson Rodriguez. You're going to have Kramer, Irvin. But who do you think from a pitching standpoint? You're going to hate this idea? No, don't do <laughs> You're it. You're going to hate it Stupid. so much. Stupid. Don't do it. Don't do it. You have, a, you, have, you have too many young, impressionable players and too many good vibes going. Listen, I, I go to Bauer and I tell him this. You are on a zero tolerance policy. No. Okay, just listen. Bauer outage, your logo, see you later. We're not going to see it anywhere. Your, your podcast, gone. Adios. Talking to the media, unless we tell you to talk to them, see you later. You're playing for the league minimum. You want to prove to us that you are reformed and you desperately want to play baseball for the league minimum? Those are my conditions. And I know that you're worried about that clubhouse. I get it. But at the end of the day, this is America. You should get a second chance. If he's really telling us the truth that he's a changed man, prove it. Get rid of all of that crap, all the baggage that nobody wants to deal with and tell them I will play for nothing, which is the me uh, league minimum. And the minute I screw up, if you if you say jump and I don't say how high, get rid of me. Because oh. if they, they need an ace, if they can get if they can retain uh, Corbin Burns and then they can bring in Bauer and they got Soto, they're a World Series caliber team, not just next year, but for the next three or four years, potentially. Well, here's the thing about it. Let's not forget about this. They are World Series calendar like contender, super power contender right now. There's no doubt about it, and they're going to be like, they're going to be that for the next four years, regardless. Now, there's a big difference between being a World Series contender and being a front runner who should win the World Series, right? And there's a big difference between being the Astros and being the Brewers and, and stuff. The Brewers have a great team. The Orioles have a great team. Orioles haven't accomplished anything yet. Now the Astros have, you know, the, the Braves World Series, like super contender every single year this year, obviously down a little bit. Phillies, super contender. There's a difference between just being a contender and being good and being really good and then being great. Um, yes. the, the Orioles have shown that they're really good. They haven't shown that they're great yet. Now they're playing great baseball. They're, they're playing incredible baseball. First place, second place, first place, second place in, in, in the AL all the time. You know, best record in baseball right there, you know, type of stuff. But you got to show it in the playoffs. And, you know, last year being out quick, that's one thing. It's your first year. Now you got that under your belt. They're going to go further this year. Now you bring in a guy like Soto. You bring in a guy, you bring back a guy like Burns or another starting pitcher, right? You go out there and, and make a move in the offseason. I think the thing is they go make a move for a school in the offseason or you go out and make a move for Crochet or or somebody that's a, the next level. You're going to own, own them for a while and they've got the players to be able to do it. That's where you make the difference. I do think as a starting pitching staff, they need another solid veteran. That's why they brought in Eflin. And, and unfortunately right now he's hurt, right? And that's why they brought in Burns. That's why they make that move. But you need more than just the Burns. And all the starting pitching in, in these great teams have shown that. You need more than just like that one dude. You need at least two nowadays. At least two. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do agree with you on that. I don't think Bauer's worth it. I don't think Bauer's worth it. And I, I don't I don't see him at the age he's going to be being out of baseball for two years. I think he'd stat wise he'll be just fine. But I think there's other pitchers available that they need. I, I mean, heck, at this point, just bring back Burns. Okay, but if you have Burns, who else are you gonna bring in? Give me a top tier starting pitcher that's gonna be available that you can bring in for a reasonable price. Fred, you're gonna you're gonna be pretty good. Max Fried. Max Fried would be an excellent addition. I'm with you on that. Now, none of these guys are value wise are going to be the same as, say, uh, I mean, like cost wise, they're going to be in a different bracket than a Bauer. Bauer's going to be for free, basically. Yeah. Right. Bauer will play for anything at, at this point. But from a value standpoint, I mean, Blake Snell's going to be available. I mean, he's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Robbie Ray might be available. There's going to be some guys that are available that don't give you those headaches, give you different headaches. <laughs> but not those headaches.
All right. I, I mean, I'd love to see Blake Snell. I think he's going to be a lot of money. He proved this year that he can pitch very well. Um, <laughs> I don't want Marcus Stroman, obviously. I definitely don't want that guy. I'm just looking to get an ace cheap, and I just don't know who's out there. I mean, Max Fried was a really good call on that. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Um, I mean, here's the thing, too, is like, here's some other names. Are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. Verlander, Scherzer, Cole might be available. Snell, Patrick Corbin, um, Robbie Ray, Charlie Morton, Giolito as an opt-out, Evaldi as a vesting option. I mean, I would go into like uh, Montas. Um, I can't Walker, trust any Walker, of those guys, though. Burns, Freed, Manaya. Again, it, I, and I get that what you're saying is very true. Bieber. Bieber's healthy. We'll be, we'll be healthy, right? Quintana. Quintana would be a good number three. Severino. Kikuchi. Mel Kelly. Uh, it's a club. It's a club option at seven million. They're definitely taking that. Are you willing to give Verlander thirty plus million? Because that's what it's going to take to keep him from retiring potentially. I'm giving Walker. I would be willing to give Walker Bueller twenty five. Okay, but I don't know if Walker Bueller will take twenty five. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know either. And and again, you're getting down into this list of of guys. It's a little thin this year with some of these players. It's a little thin. I mean, it's heavy on some names up top, mm -hmm. but then gets a little, I mean, there's a little thin on like, there's not a guy outside of like, I mean, again, Cole, who knows if, if there's an opt out at 36 million. That's, I mean, I don't know if he's going to take that. Blake Snell has a player option at, at $38 million, right? Right. Like there's certain things here that, that are going to happen. But outside of that, it gets a lot of number two and threes pretty quick. And you got the Verlander Scherzer, but again, I don't know if I'm going to invest if I'm the Orioles, I don't know if I'm going to invest that money into a Verlander. But if I did, like it's spending $35 million and you're not going to have to sign him for two, three years. You know, I know your personal views towards Trevor Bauer, but I want to know your honest to God opinion, what your heart tells you. Next year, the Orioles are one pitcher away and you have the option between Trevor Bauer at zero money or Max Scherzer at $35 million. What's the better play? Bauer would be the better pitcher. I still don't think it's worth it, man. In a day and age of 2025, we're dealing with what we deal with every single day in in marketing and management of your fans. Too much of a headache. I'm good. I know the Orioles fans. They desperately want to win. They, they really don't give a rat's ass. If they can beat the Yankees and the Red Sox and Bauer is, is a you know canoe, I don't think they care. I think they will. That's the thing that's stopping them. And again, one thing we have to say this is, yes, one of the accusers has fallen off and, and is, is crazy psycho, like should be in jail type of thing. There are other accusers and they have not ever been doubted. Like but Trevor we're... never hasn't Trevor's never said a single word about the other accusers. Forget about all that, though. No, forget I can't about that. forget about that. You can't forget about all that because that's why he's not getting signed. Right. And because I long before he ever got signed with the Dodgers, they were they had problems with um, with the uh, with other women. And this happened while he's with the Dodgers. So there's other issues coming up. And that's again, like that's what's stopping you. If that wasn't there, I would say, hell yeah, sign the douche. I'd say just because you're a douchebag doesn't mean you can't win baseball games. Be a, be a douchebag and sign them. That's fine because teammates tend to actually like the guy sometimes. Sometimes. Sign them. But that's all there. And I and at the end of the day, I would take my chances with Grayson Rodriguez. I'd take my chances with their entire pitching staff that they already have than I would with Trevor because there's no point in taking these guys. You, at the end, of the, you still have... Um, Okay, you're going to have Suarez, Kramer, Cole Irvin. You're going to have Bradish, Eflin, uh, John Means will, will be back if he if he's healthy and stuff. And Grayson Rodriguez, Tyler Wells. I'm taking those guys. And I'm going to bat versus somebody who's already has so many issues and half the league already doesn't like him. And half of baseball, half of fans don't like him. And if you've ever been on Twitter and you're not a douchebag, you don't like him. I get it. All right, you know what? I, I'm so glad that we went to this extreme on Trevor Bauer. So now I know exactly how we're going to give away this baseball card. If you want to win the Paul Skeens 2024 Bowman Prospect, I will ship it to anywhere in the United States. All you got to do is three things. You have to like, you have to subscribe, and comment who you would rather have next year. Would you rather have Trevor Bauer or Max Scherzer? As long as we get 50 likes, subscribes, and comments... You're in the uh, running, and I will send it out to whoever gets picked randomly. 
I think that's fair. What do you think, Arts? I think that's fair. So you definitely wouldn't go for Bauer. If I'm the Baltimore Orioles, I take a shot at him and I give him zero tolerance. But Trevor Bauer, if you're watching this video for some reason, tell me, address it. Would you be willing to give up your YouTube channel? Would you be willing up to give up your Bauer outage logo and all that stuff? And would you be willing to do a no tolerance policy? Because that's the only way I would give you a job if I'm the owner of a team. If you're not willing to do that, then this is all a moot point. Get out. Then get out. Just enjoy Mexico. Go enjoy the beach. <laughs> there are worse things in the world than being on the beach in Mexico. That's it for this week. I guess we will uh, talk about this next week.